This lecture features A. Witherell Johnson, the founder of Bible Study Fellowship. Formerly a missionary with the China Inland Mission, Miss Johnson founded BSF in 1959 and served as an executive director. This recording, drawn from the BSF archives, clearly reveals her passion for the Lord, His Word and His people. The audio quality of this recording may require intentional listening. Turn with me to John chapter 7. In John chapter 7, we have a very vivid picture of the humanity of our Lord Jesus. You know, sometimes with a very strong stress from some people who refuse to see Jesus as any more than a man, we who see him as God's unique son, sometimes we stress his deity, his divinity, to such an extent that we also fall into the danger of heresy of not realizing how human the Lord was. You know, you and I, when we get precious in life, we say, oh my, nobody understands how hard this is. And these children provoke me so much that I can't help doing this. And this pressure is so hard that what can I do but do this? And how can I help myself to do this? And then somebody else speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ and you say, Oh, well, after all, he was the Son of God. He had it in him. I don't. But this wasn't the case. Because our Lord Jesus Christ emptied himself and became in all points like us, except without sin. And in a sense, when you take the sin away, he was really exactly like you and me. In other words, he had the same pressures than you and I had. And he didn't meet them in his Godhead. He met them by the power of the Holy Spirit within him, just like you have. This was why he came, to show that a man and a woman could live in pressures and could overcome. And the very spirit by which he overcame, the very personality by which he overcame, the very method by which he overcame, he has given us, and this is what we get when we have Christ living in us. He got the experience of being a human, and then he came into us so that I have the same person within me to do this. Well, I thought that I would call this chapter mostly how Jesus meant met pressure all kinds of pressure. And we would look at something of the pressures that Jesus had. Chapter 7, verse 1, Jesus was walking in Galilee, and he didn't walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. However, the time had come for the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, it was the Jewish order that every male Jew who lived 20 miles within Jerusalem had to go up for all the three feasts of the year. But of course Galilee was more than 20 miles, so they didn't always go up. But Jesus' brothers now began to press him. Press him. Now in verse 2, 3, his brothers all gathered around Jesus and said, Now look, It's no use your doing all these miracles and preaching in Galilee and getting a great crowd in Galilee. You go on up to Jerusalem. Why did they say this? The Bible says they said it because they didn't believe in it. As far as Jesus' brothers were concerned, they knew they had a special brother in their midst. It's like a family who might have a prodigy, a musical prodigy, a little genius. And what the family wants to do is to push the little prodigy out and the little genius out and uh, then get all the glory to the family. This is what they want. So they said to Jesus, now don't hide your light under a bushel. If you're really what you say, you go and do some miracles in Jerusalem and let's just get you moving up here. Oh, how often do well-meaning people, sometimes for themselves, sometimes not for themselves, try to push you and me to run before God. 
and to do something they think we should do. I might go a little bit further and I might say there is something inside me. I always have a fifth column inside me, do you? And something inside me again and again wants to push me to run before God, to push a situation, to pull strings, to go and to, 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 to press the situation. And so in answer to the pressure of his brothers, Jesus gives three points. And you'll be interested to see they're in couplets of contrast. Do you see? Couplets of contrast. Verse 5, verse 4 and 5 are the brethren's words. Now here you have three couplets. Verse 6 and 7. Jesus said, My time is not yet come. Your time is always. Contrast. Secondly, in verse 7 he says, The world cannot hate you. Me, it hates. And the third point is, in 8, You go up for the feast, I'm not going. Now, he didn't mean he wasn't going completely, but he wasn't going with them. He probably went up privately, and maybe he stayed with Mary and Bethany, but anyhow, it wasn't public. Now, I want us to think of this because there's a real message here. Do you realize that not your money and not your talent, but probably the time is the greatest thing you have. Oh, how important it is that we bring our time to the Lord. Did you ever think of reading chapter 7 and saying, Lord, will you give me a verse today? And Lord, I have 12 hours, I have 14 hours, however many hours you have and leave for sleep. I have so many hours today, and Lord, on my knees this morning, I want my time is for you. I want you to say what I'm going to do today. Jesus knew when he went into the Feast of the Tabernacles. Jesus knew when he went into Jerusalem, they'd seek to kill him. He knew there'd be trouble. And you know that when you speak to so-and-so and so-and-so, you may have persecution. But there are two things you must do. You mustn't hold back when God says it. But on the other hand, don't run before it. It's not only the thing that has to be done, but the, the timing that is so important. And so Jesus says the first thing, he says, my time isn't ready. And then he says a terrible thing. He says, you can go anytime. Your time is your own anyway. So your time is always. But my time I have an aim in life. I have a work. I have something that's exciting. I have, God has given me such a life that every minute of the day can be blessed by God and used by God. The second thing he says is that the world can't hate you because you belong to it. Isn't that sad? that the people who ne- lived nearest to the Lord were the people who didn't believe him till after his death. You know, I think James and Jude, who believed him afterwards, must have kicked themselves many a time. But when Jesus lived in this world, they were one of his trials, not one of his helps. Well, what does the world mean? The world is the world of people who don't own Jesus Christ. Now let's move on, shall we, to the next scene. Well, the next scene is pressure from public opinion. And the public opinion begins uh, in verse 10. And it goes right through now to verse 30. Um, in the first place, Jesus Christ did go up. After his brethren had gone up, probably in the public caravan and by the main street, To Jerusalem, Jesus went up privately. And meanwhile, verses 10 to 13 tell us what people talked about Jesus, how they looked about Jesus. And you know, doesn't it, doesn't it read in a modern setting? Doesn't it seem modern to you? 
First, they, uh, there's a lot of murmuring, there's a lot of discussion. Some said, well, he's a good man. He's good. It's a good idea to go to church, be religious. It's good, he's good. Jesus of Nazareth is good. People say this today. And then some people said, no, he deceives the people. Well, we've got quite a block of people who say this. We've got certain non-Christian scientists who say, let's get away with religion because it's delusion. There's no Jesus, the Son of God. There's no heaven. There's no resurrection. There's no miracle. Let's demythologize, uh, demythologize all religion. Let's do away with all the miracles, all the supernaturals, all the angels. Let's do away with it. And then, of course, in verse 11, you have the Jews, meaning the Jewish Pharisees and the leaders, who sought to kill him. Now, do you get a little bit of the feeling of uh, disturbance? Feeling of, uh, you don't know what's going to happen any minute. Now, verse 14. How does Jesus deal with this kind of person? When he knows people try to kill him, when he knows people think he deceives the people, and that he better be squelched, what do they do? Well, he goes right into the most public place he can go, which is the temple, and in the middle of the feast, when it is really impossible to see him because of the pressure of public opinion all around, he starts teaching. I want you to get a, a picture of this temple. Outside this great, beautiful temple of Herod, there was a huge court called the Court of the Gentiles. And on both sides of the court, there were two arcades with great columns to get out of the front. And it was in these arcades that people would walk back and forth, you know, on the holiday like this, a religious holiday. And it was here that the rabbis would sit down and have little groups of their disciples all around them. Probably that was what happened when Jesus went when he was aged 12 years to one of these feet. And the rabbis would be sitting around and people sat all around them, just like your discussion group, asking questions and being answered. And people would pass and they'd say things and, and there'd be interruptions, but each rabbi would have his own little disciples, his own little group of disciples. And Jesus, of course, would have his 12 disciples around and other people would gather on the fringe, and bit by bit the crowd would get greater. And so here was Jesus teaching publicly all of them. Now what did he teach? It's as though he said, the thing that I teach is the truth. Whether you like it or not, my doctrine is of God. Wasn't that rather presumptuous that he isn't God? Now, supposing you have intellectual doubts, what do you do? I love chapter verse 17 because this is how I came to Christ. Verse 17, Jesus says, if people don't know whether to believe it, supposing you are in this group today, supposing you say, you know, I haven't heard of this before. Is this true? Now, I believe strongly in this text. You say you have an intellectual doubt. Do you know what I really think it is? You know it's a moral issue. You don't want to believe because of your background. You don't want to believe because it may involve certain changes in your life. You don't want to believe because you've been considered a, an intellectual and in your group they just think that you've lost your reason and got rocks in your head if you believe it. And you don't like to go through it. Isn't this honest? What I am saying is, are you willing to go down on your knees and to say, God, I don't even know if there is a God. Jesus, I don't even know. But a any cost I'm willing to believe, I truly seek. Then when God answers you, will you be honest and pick it up? And he won't blame you for your intellectual doubts, but I'll tell you what he'll do. He'll answer them slowly, one by one, until you have this deep inner conviction. Oh, it's a wonderful text. You can see why I love verse 17, can't you? 
The second thing he says is, if you're honest, and if you will submit your will to the creator of the universe, God will tell you whether I'm just man or the son of God, the unique son of God. The third point he is he gave is verse 18, that there was no unrighteousness in himself. He pointed to his personal life that had no sin. And the fourth part comes where he spoke of the proof of his power in verse 22 and 23. Now you may be puzzled in 22 and 23, though you may have had it in your classes. You know, Jesus, the Jews complained in John chapter 5 because he'd made a man whole on the Sabbath day. He'd worked on the Sabbath day. It was against their law to cure a person on the Sabbath day. And so Jesus said, how, how inconsistent can you be? Even you priests. Even you priests work on the Sabbath day. I'll prove it to you. If a baby is born and the eighth day comes, which was a rigid Jewish law that you have to circumcise a child on the eighth day, this is hygienic, this is moral, this is good. If a baby's eighth day happens to fall on the Sabbath day, then the priests have got to work and circumcise. Now Jesus said, you circumcise a baby on the eighth day because it's your way of physical well-being. It also involves a moral well-being. It is also the initiation of this baby into the Jewish church, into the Jewish community. Well, if you make that little bit of physical part of this baby whole on the Sabbath day, if you just do this little bit of healing on the Sabbath day, and that's work, how much more should you let me make a man completely whole on the Sabbath? Oh, what power Jesus has. To take a person and make him well, physically and spiritually, is power. Now, what was the reaction? The people said, my word, why don't people take him? Why the Jews have been seeking to kill him, and here they could just catch him up like that. Why don't they take him? And then the third thing says, well, if the rulers aren't taking him, maybe it's because they believe he's in See? These people, they didn't say, I believe, but they wanted to see what the rulers were doing. And then they said, yes, but he can't be Messiah. Because when Messiah comes, the belief was he'd just appear in heaven and come down from Malachi. And they said, but him? Why, we know where he lives. The point I want to bring over to you is they didn't know where he lived. They thought he was born in Nazareth and he was born in Bethlehem. How did Jesus answer this pressure? How did Jesus deal with this pressure? Well, you might say he dealt with it in the line of prophecy. He dealt with it in the line of saying, I am going to heaven. My Father is with me. I am going to heaven. This is where I belong. This is the permanence of my life. I am going to heaven. He sent it. And the result was this, that some believed and some didn't. Have you got my outline? The first was the private pressure, and Jesus answered it by poise. He didn't let his brethren push him around. He just quietly kept in God's will. The second pressure of personal public opinion Jesus answered it by proclaiming the message. And when people try to shut your mouth, don't let your mouth be shut up. You have a message to give. But be sure that the Lord is using your lips to give it. Take the courage of the Lord and go on giving it just the same. Because even though they have all the questions of public opinion like these people had, you can't get away from this. This is the truth. And God is back of the truth. And you cannot muzzle the truth. God did send Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. And if you are with Jesus, and God knows that you're with him in spite of your sins, God will vindicate the children. Isn't this wonderful? Now the third pressure is the pressure of persecution. 
And here you get it in verse 30. Then they sought to take him, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. Many people believed him, 31. And then you get the Pharisees. And here is when Jesus Christ says, he speaks about his departure. He says, in a little while you won't see me. I'm going to heaven. In a little while you won't see me. Heaven is my home. My father is in heaven. Heaven is my home. I understand that if a person is really preaching according to the will of God, he'll say much about heaven. He'll say much about the fact that Jesus Christ is coming soon. So Jesus is talking about his departure. And he says, where I'm going, you Jews can't come. He turned around and he spoke of the promise of the Holy Spirit. Isn't this a lovely thing to do when you people persecute you? When they tried to persecute Jesus, Jesus turned around and he says, I've got something wonderful to give you. I am, he said, the living water. He said, if any man is thirsty. He looked at the temple officers who'd come to take him. He looked at the soldiers who'd come to take him. He looked at the people around who'd come to take him. He knew they couldn't touch him. He was in God. Don't you ever worry about persecution. Nobody can touch you until God's time has come. And looking squarely at these officers who had come to take him and to arrest him and to kill him, and looking at all the people around, half of them didn't know what he was and they were a confused bunch. And then he calls. And first he gives an appeal. He says, Are you thirsty? Would you like to know the real meaning of life? Would you like to be emotionally satisfied? Would you like to have a power to change the bad habits of your life? Would you like to be delivered from alcoholism? Would you like to be delivered from drugs? Would you like to be delivered from worry? Would you like to be delivered from a bad temper? Would you like to be delivered from lust? Would you like to be delivered from this unforgiving bitterness of yourself? Would you like to be delivered? Are you thirsty to be made a good person? Are you thirsty for power? Are you thirsty for satisfaction? Are you thirsty to feel God's love? I would like to know you're really in me. I would like to be able to forgive this person and I can't. I would like to get rid of this habit. I would like to be able to help my boy, my husband. Jesus, I drink of you. Now I've come, and I've come to drink. Now the next step, the thing is on you now. I've come. The second thing is a promise. He says, first, if you come, you will be personally satisfied. Oh, that day when I thought I was so clever. I thought I was so intellectual. I thought I was so above my parents. I thought I was so advanced in my thinking. But oh, how empty I was. And when I discovered and God revealed to me that Jesus is the Son of God and I took him to be my Savior, I remember going down on my knees, and I don't weep easily, but I wept with joy, and the next day I could hardly contain myself for the joy of feeling a fulfillment within me and the companionship of Jesus Christ. That is that. But more than that, when you come to the Lord, you know he does something in you. And I'm always meeting one and another lady here who is so satisfied and who is so helped in this class that she's concerned by her neighbor next door. Her neighbor next door is lonely. Her neighbor next door has a problem. Her neighbor around the corner is such a lovely person and yet she knows that she's, you know, so unsatisfied. And so this person who is drunk of Christ says, do come with me. When the Holy Spirit is filling their emotions, their minds, their words, there is a drawing power. And 
Haven't you seen it with a struggle in your home, you know, with all the homes upside down, everybody's at each other's uh, necks? And you sit there and you quietly ask the Lord to take hold. Have you just watched it come? Have you seen the rivers of living water somehow go out from you in comfort? Comfort to your oppressed and tired and discouraged husband? Comfort to Johnny who's coming back? Comfort? This is what the Lord promises. The first thing is something for you and then the second thing is something for the family. Now the last point I want to bring out clearly is this. What did Jesus mean? Let's look at these verses. If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Well, I'm a practical person. I like to know what this means. He that believeth of me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, which is really the emotional place, as they believed in the old days, shall flow rivers of living water. What did he mean? Well, the next verse tells you. This he spoke of the Holy Spirit, which they should, that believe on him, should in the future receive. Not now, receive. Because the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm sitting with you, and I'm your comforter right here and now. You can touch me, you can look into my eyes, you can hold my hand, you can look at me. But I'm going off to heaven. But I'm going to send you another me. This is what the Greek means. The Greek word for another is somebody exactly like me, but a different person. Even the Holy Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because the world doesn't see him, doesn't know him. And then he says, but you know him, because he dwells with you. How is the Holy Spirit with the disciples? The Holy Spirit was in Jesus. And Peter was Peter, and Jesus was Jesus, but the Holy Spirit was with Peter because he was in Jesus. And so Peter felt his influence. A lot of people have the Holy Spirit with them. You've got the Holy Spirit with you today. You've got a lot of people who have the Holy Spirit in them, and they're sitting next to you. And the Holy Spirit is with you. But Jesus said, after I've gone to heaven and send the Holy Spirit down, instead of having the Holy Spirit with you, or Jesus with you, you can have him inside you. And if you will understand it, when you drink of Jesus, Jesus' human body is in heaven. But the spirit that makes Jesus who he is, is with you. But if you will have it, you can say, I don't want the drink outside of me. I want the drink inside. And Jesus comes through the Holy Spirit to dwell not with you only, but in the of the past. Oh, what was the result? Many believe. The last scene is the Sanhedrin. And all the officers and the policemen and the soldiers and the Pharisees all come back and there's this great circle of the Sanhedrin all sitting. And in front of them come the soldiers. And the high priest looks at the soldiers and he says, Well, where's the prisoner? And the officers and the soldiers look and they said, We couldn't take him. You couldn't take one man? What's the matter with you? And the soldiers said, Never did we ever hear a man who spoke like him. And the Sanhedrin said, Are you crazy? None of us rulers have believed on him. None of the intellectuals believe on him. It, it wasn't true, but they said it. And then away back, was one man who was just fidgeting on his feet. He was one of the circle. And he was getting so fidgety. And finally he went scarlet. And he said, 
Let's read what he said. He said, does our law judge a person before we hear it? Was it a timid confession or was it a bold one? Everybody has a different feeling. It was bold because if you sat in that crowd with 70, would you speak up and be the only one out of 70 speaking up? But wasn't it timid? He could have said so much more, couldn't he? He could have said, I believe in him and I'm a ruler. Of course he got snubbed. But oh, isn't Nicodemus glad he spoke up today? And I think today he probably looks back and he says, my word, I wish I said a lot more, but still he said something. And this is what it will always be. You see, when Jesus was persecuted, the more he was persecuted, the more he gave out a message with power, and such was the power that even the soldiers believed, and the rulers believed. Don't you believe you can't be an intellectual and believe in Jesus? Isaac Newton, one of the most wonderful scientists of the world, was a deep believer in Jesus. Paul, the most brilliant man the world has known, was a deep believer in Jesus. Nicodemus became a deep believer in Jesus. There is power, there is the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus. And wherever you proclaim him, you're going to find that somebody believes, probably, as you meet his objection. And you meet his real questions with the power that Jesus gives, and with the poise that he gives, and with the real conviction and assurance that he has. Shall we go? This lecture was written and produced by Bible Study Fellowship. For more information on BSF resources and Bible study groups, please visit bsfinternational.org.